you can go through trouble, but keep a good attitude and just keep loving Jesus, you'll find that you get to the other side of that trouble. And yes, it was hard. Yes, it might've kicked you in the guts, but you came to the other side of that trouble with resource in your hand. Now I've got something with which I can comfort and strengthen others. Welcome to the Calvary Podcast. For more information about a Calvary campus near you or to join us online, visit our website, calvarycc.global. I want to speak to you today uh, from the thought, the truth about trouble. The truth about trouble. Uh, we'll have a QR code on the screen in a moment. If you've got uh, the Uversion Bible app, you can scan that QR code. They'll hold it on the screen for a couple of minutes and uh, you can access all the notes from today's message on there and use them in your connect group this week. But I want to speak to, to you about this thought, the truth about trouble. Anyone here, you've ever been in a little bit of trouble? Just give us a wave. Have you ever been in a little bit of trouble? Some of you are just lying or not paying attention. Come on. Ever been in a little bit of trouble? Oh, I think all of us can go through a bit of trouble from time to time. Uh, our kids, uh, Sarah and I have got four kids age eight and under, and they're at that age where they've just realised that mum and dad were once kids too which means mum and dad probably did naughty things when they were young as well. And so they love getting stories. My, my son will often come up to me, Dad, tell us a story about something naughty you did when you were a kid. I said, I don't have any son. Talk to your mother. She's got heaps. <laughs> and, and so uh, their, their favourite stories are um, when I threw my elder sister through a glass window and sent her to hospital as a little kid. They, they love that story. It's kind of morbid, but they love it. And uh, there's another story about uh, when I was in school and me and the grade 10 boys thought it would be a great idea to go water bombing. And uh, I loved a water bomb that happened to hit the major sponsor of the school festival right on the back of his shirt and got a Saturday morning detention for that. Anyway, they love those stories. They, they love to know that dad, you know, as a kid got into trouble. And the reality is uh, trouble is uh, part of the human experience. Uh, just because you're in church doesn't mean that you're immune from trouble. Uh, all of us can face it. And trouble has various channels into our lives. Who knows, sometimes trouble comes into our life because of our own dumb decisions. Anyone here ever made a poor decision that brought trouble into your life? Just, just come on, give us a wave. Don't, don't be proud. Uh, don't point at someone else, but just give us a wave. Sometimes we just, through our own folly, through our own sin, through our own poor judgment, we make decisions and, and it brings trouble into our life. Other times, um, trouble comes because of the decisions of other people. People like to say these days that, well, what's right for you is right for you and what's right for me is right for me. And as long as I live my truth and you, you live your truth, we'll all get along okay. But that's nonsense because all of our lives are so interconnected. Who knows, one person can make a decision that brings trouble to a whole lot of other people. That's the reality. No person is an island. We are in community. And so sometimes you walk through trouble because another person made a bad judgment call. Someone else can't control their anger and you walked through trouble because of their lack of self-control. Someone else made a poor decision professionally or in a business deal. Someone else took substances and, and their behaviour then affected your world. The reality is sometimes we go through trouble because of our own choices, but sometimes we go through trouble because of the choices of other people. And sometimes trouble comes into our life just because we live in a broken world. Who knows, this world is not as it ought be. There is a brokenness about this world where some things are, you know, realities in our world, even though we wish they weren't. Who knows, country music is a genre. This world is broken, I tell you. People have cats as pets. This world is broken. People eat tofu when there's perfectly good meat on offer. This world is broken. The, the reality is sometimes trouble comes just because we live in a broken world. When a natural disaster strikes, trouble comes and, and no one chose it, but but there's trouble. There'd be people even in the service today and chronic pain is a part of your daily reality. Not for lack of faith, you've prayed, you've believed, but, but you live with pain. Well, whose fault is that? Well, reality is sometimes just there is a brokenness to our world, which means that trouble is part of our existence. And so trouble can come into our life through many channels and trouble also has its many forms. Uh, there can be work trouble, family trouble, health trouble, trouble with money, trouble with family, trouble with neighbours, trouble with clients, uh, trouble with the law. Just look straight ahead. 
trouble with the law. Uh, you can get, you know, uh, I, you know, sometimes when I get a speeding fine, I, I say, honey, it's, it's actually a certificate of efficiency that the government gives me. Cause I'm just, I, I just get from A to B really promptly. And there's big numbers on it. I think it's the kilometers per hour. I don't know what the numbers are, but who knows? You, you can get into all kinds of trouble. Albert Hubbard said this, life is just one damn thing after another. And sometimes it can feel that way. Sometimes it feels like there's three certainties in life, life, death, and Trouble, because <laughs> it just seems like it's a certainty. Job uh, in, in the Bible was a man who went through enormous trouble. He said this, yet man is born to trouble as surely as sparks fly upward. Do sparks fly upward? Yes, they do. Does trouble happen in our life? Yes, it does. Uh, G- Jesus himself affirmed this. Now, oftentimes um, Christians like to get their favourite you know, Bible verses and put them on a tea towel or a coffee mug or on a poster on their wall. But I've never seen anyone put this verse on their wall. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. Who knows? No one puts that up on a poster. But the reality is Jesus said it and it's true. And it's because life has its troubles and its challenges and its discomforts that there is an enormous industry for products and experiences that bring comfort in the midst of our discomfort. Uh, Who knows, in an attempt to soothe life's troubles, some people turn to eating. Who knows, there is a category called comfort food. Oh, don't act like you don't know about it. Well, we, some, some people binge eat as an attempt to forget their troubles. People binge on alcohol. Or, or drugs, people, people drink too much. And it's not just, well, they like the flavour. No, 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 it, it brings a comfort. It's an escape from life's troubles. Uh, some people just binge Netflix series or engage in sexual pleasure or sensuality or gambling or doom scrolling on their phone just, just to escape rather than actually deal with life's troubles or, or shopping, retail therapy. People go shopping to try to just, we won't do an altar call now, all right? Um, Why all of this can be an attempt to deal with and to medicate from life's troubles. And so the real question is not, will you have troubles? Because if you're breathing, you're probably going to experience some trouble. The real question is not, will you have troubles? The question is is really this, where will you go and what will you do when trouble strikes? That's the better question that we should focus our attention on. And sadly, for some people in our world, Christianity or the church would be the last place they go or they think to go when trouble comes because they've got this animated, airbrushed, idealised version of Christianity that, well, Christians are people who never go through troubles. But the reality is there is actually a strong relationship between the Christian faith and pain, trouble and suffering. In fact, what I want to do today is I want to just read a small portion from a letter that is part of the Bible. So if you're new to church, the Bible, that word Bible simply means book and And it's actually a library of books. There's 66 books in the Bible and uh, multiple genres of books. And one of those genres is letters. And so there's a letter called 2 Corinthians, which is a letter written by an early church leader called Paul to people in a city called Corinth. If he was writing it today to you, I guess that book of the Bible would be called Townsvillians uh, or Townsvillains, but that's a bit incriminating. And so this letter was written about 55, 56 AD. And one of the key themes of this this letter is the relationship between suffering and the Christian life. Because what had been happening is some of Paul's opponents had been writing nasty things on their social media about Paul, saying that Paul was not a legitimate Christian and Paul was not a genuine Christian leader because he had gone through too much trouble and suffering. You see, these people had this simplistic notion that if you really are a spirit-filled, bona fide Christian, if you really are a believer in God and a good person, then you won't go through pain. And there'd be people here today and that's exactly how you think. That if I'm a real Christian, if God really loves me, then I won't go through pain or suffering. And and the problem with that we'll unpack today is that when you inevitably do go through trouble, you start to question, am I really a bona fide Christian? And so what Paul is doing is he's writing this letter to help the recipients to see that it's actually through weakness and suffering that God has chosen to reveal himself to the world and to bring comfort to others. So let's read a portion of this letter. It says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, 
or literally means the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. I'm just gonna leave it there. I wanna share today three truths about trouble. If you're taking notes because you wanna get to heaven, just jot these down. Number one is this. Number, the first truth about trouble is that all of us experience troubles. All of us. You know, there is a temptation to imagine that you are the only one in the room who is going through trouble. And I think what's happened is that social media has reinforced this mindset among us because most of us post our highlights on social media. So we see the best 30 seconds of everyone else's day, but we see the full 24 hour cycle of behind the scenes in our own day. And so we can start to imagine everyone else has got a trouble free existence. I'm the only one who's actually dealing with some stuff. Do you catch what I'm saying today? Um, Sarah and I were, were fortunate in late July, early August to go um, on holidays. We went to Bali and we're in Bali for 16 nights and uh, it was great. And I think of the 16 nights, there was about 11 nights when our kids weren't sick. So we get there by day three, the kids start getting sick. And, uh, but, but Sarah, you know, posts on social media and I put some posts on social media and you post the sunsets and the nice lunch and the kids smiling. And so I get back from Bali and uh, everyone's like, oh, how was the holiday? It looks so refreshing. It looked amazing. And I'm like, yeah, that's because we didn't post the vomit on the kitchen floor and the GP visit and the 37 bottles of Nurofen. I mean, I'd take that off the tape. And so... Who knows what happens is we post the highlights, we post the best, we ignore the rest. And then what happens is we see everyone else's best moments and we start to imagine that we are the only ones who are going through troubles. But Paul clearly says that God comforts us, plural, in all of our, plural, troubles. And I think we need to be reminded of this because isn't it true that when we find ourselves in trouble, we can start to imagine that we are the only ones in church today who are going through some stuff. The reality is everyone has trouble. Good people go through troubles, bad people go through troubles. Tall people go through troubles, short people go through troubles. Thin people go through troubles, Formerly thin people go through troubles. White people go through troubles. Black people go through troubles. Religious people go through troubles. Non-religious people go through troubles. Rich people go through troubles. Poor people go through troubles. And everyone in between. Who knows, we all go through trouble. Are you feeling encouraged today? And so, of course, life certainly does deal to some people a more difficult hand than to others. So I'm not trying to diminish people who are going through extreme pain at the moment. But, but what does all this mean? If trouble is actually something that all of us go through, there's a couple of implications that we should think about. First is this, we shouldn't be quick to interpret trouble as God's punishment. You know, there can be this simplistic notion that Christians can swallow up, that if you are a good moral person, then God owes you a neat, tidy, trouble-free life. But, but I go to church every Sunday and I volunteer on a team and, and I'm a good person. Oh, I don't use bad language. Oh, I tithe. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty moral. Oh, and so we, we can start to think because I've done A, B, C, D, E, therefore God owes me all of these things. But, but life is not that simple, is it? It's just gotten real quiet in this highly troubled congregation. <laughs> Life's not that simple. You can be a good person and go through bad trouble. Ask Job how it went. Job was a good and righteous man, and yet he went through trouble. Ask Jesus how it went. No one more righteous than Jesus, and yet he was crucified upon the cross. And so the problem is, if we believe that a good moral life guarantees a neat, tidy, trouble-free life, then what happens is when trouble inevitably strikes, we necessarily conclude that it must be God punishing us for some wrongdoing. And so what happens is trouble hits 
And then to make it worse, we start doing an inventory of our last 15 years, doing a witch hunt on our past, trying to find what was the bad thing I did for which God is now punishing me. Listen, this is where it's really important that Christians actually know the Bible. You see, the Bible is very different to karma. Karma says, if you do bad, you will get bad. You will reap what you have sowed. And certainly there is a principle in Scripture, but there is a difference when it comes to sin. You see, the Bible says that Christ upon the cross Cross, took all of the penalty for our sin. All of my iniquity and wrongdoing was laid upon Him at the cross. He was righteous. I'm full of sin. He took all of my sins so that we could receive all of His righteousness, which means this, when I go through trouble, I don't start doing a witch hunt through my past going, what's God punishing me for? I don't need to because I've looked at the cross. And when I looked at the cross, I saw that Christ took the punishment for all of my sin and wrongdoing. That's why the Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation, not just then when I get to heaven, now. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Is anyone in Christ today? If you're in Christ, you don't need to interpret trouble as God's punishment for your wrongdoing. No, no, no. God's punishment has been fully absorbed in the person of Jesus upon the cross. Can you say amen today? Which means I can keep a a calm mind in trouble. Look at what the Bible says in Psalm 34, verse 19. The righteous person may have many troubles. Who? The righteous person. In other words, you you can have a good heart, be, be, be living clean before God and yet still go through trouble. And it says, but the Lord delivers him from them all. Here's the second thought. Just don't be too quick to indulge self-pity in times of trouble. I don't know about you, but I am quick to run to self-pity. Like when I get sick, my wife can be sick and she soldiers on because the four kids don't, don't really understand whether or not mum's sick. They still go to her. Can I get an amen from all the mums? Mums don't get sick days. But when I get sick, it's a severe plight. It's the man flu. Ladies, you wouldn't understand, but it has been proven to be equal to childbirth. I mean, it's a horrible thing. And when I get sick, I'm pretty sure planets stop spinning when I sick. The, the government has to just pause it sitting. Everything stops when I, can I get an amen from the men? Well, some of you are brave. When, when, when I go through pain, I like to imagine that how the whole world, actually, it's amazing how quickly I descend into self-pity. Sarah had one of our kids in ED about 18 months ago at the local hospital. It, they were okay. It was just a bit of a breathing thing. So it was more precautionary than anything. But, but this particular one of our children really likes to make sure everyone knows when they're suffering. And so Sarah's in ED and, and it must have been a full moon because ED is packed. And um, people with genuine problems, like broken limbs and just bad stuff in ED. And yet my child at the top of their lungs yells out, I'm dying. Sarah's like, it's all right, he's, he's not. And uh, that, that can happen. We, we can tend to kind of exaggerate out. And again, I'm not saying that your trouble is not real. I'm just saying we've got to realise that everyone goes through trouble. Let, let, let's not adopt a victim mindset like we're the only one going through trouble because all of us go, here's the third thought on this. Um, Don't be too quick to judge others in your world because they're probably dealing with some trouble. I just reckon um, our families would be better. Our workplaces would be better. Our church community would always be better if we gave one another like 10% grace, maybe more than 10%, maybe 11 If we just gave each other a bit more grace, acknowledging that people are kind of like icebergs. What you see is 10%. There's 90% beneath the surface that you just don't know what they're dealing with behind the scenes. All you saw is is that they're a little bit short with you in their email. And yet you don't know that, that their child is actually genuinely really sick at the moment. Or you don't know what they're dealing with behind the scenes. Who knows, we'd all do better if we just offer a bit more grace to people. People are like icebergs. You could say it this way, people are like restaurants. You've got the dining room floor where everything's calm and beautiful and presentable. But then you've got the kitchen out the back where you've got Gordon Ramsay swearing and chucking saucepans. And who knows, who knows, all of us have got both the dining room, the public face, and we've all got the kitchen as well. And, uh, and so I just think we, we should actually learn 
learned just how to adopt a stance of assuming the best of one another and giving grace to one another. Look at what um, James says in James 1.19. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to become angry. Here's the second truth. It's that God comforts us in our troubles. God comforts us in our troubles. Um, Look at what Paul says. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, literally means the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our troubles. You know, there's a side of God that you only meet when you go through trouble. Think about it this way. You never really meet your lawyer until you get into legal trouble. You never really meet your doctor until you get into health trouble. You really never really meet your plumber until you get into You know, until you've got, you know, cracks all through your plumbing. And so you, you, you only meet them when you go through stuff. Well, there's a side of God that you only meet when you go through trouble. Uh, you, you only really meet God as your forgiver of sin when you've made a mess of your life and, and totally stuffed it and you need forgiveness. Who knows, that's when you meet God's forgiveness. Anyone here ever met God's forgiveness? Thank God for it. Uh, you only really know God as your comfort when you've gone through discomfort. You only really know Jesus as your healer if you've gone through some pain. You only know him as the Prince of Peace if you've had some sleepless nights. That's why Paul says that I may know him and the fellowship of his sufferings. Who, who knows that there is actually, there is a communion that you learn with God. There is a connection you learn with God in the midst of suffering that you would have never learned any other way. God comforts us in all of our sufferings. We actually see all three members, I believe, of the Trinity referred to here. Paul talks about the father of compassion, literally means the father of mercies. And I'm so glad that even though life has its challenges, its troubles, its pains, that we understand that behind it all, there is not just a God, not just a deity, but there is a father. And he's not a father of just judgment, he's a father of mercy, Aren't you glad for that today, church? You know, the atheist would say that behind this human experience, behind reality, there is nothing more than unseeing, unfeeling, uncaring, blind, random, chance, matter, energy. That's all there is. Who knows? What a great comfort. (laughs) You're going through suffering. The universe doesn't care. You're going through a divorce. Blind matter doesn't care. You're going through chronic injury. The universe doesn't feel anything. It's just all just nature, just atoms and matter and stuff. Who knows, there is no comfort in that. I actually take great comfort in the fact that behind this human experience, there is a father of mercies who we can look to and find mercy and grace in time of need. Now, now the critic would say, well, will you just believe in God because you find that idea comforting? It's wish fulfillment. God's not really there. He's just a comfort to you. It's like a, it's like a, a, a transcendent comfort blanket. And that's why you believe in God. It's like wish fulfillment. But, but I actually think some things are both true and comforting. And, and something can be both of those things. For my kids, the, the, the existence of their mother is a great comfort. And she's true. I find caffeine to be a great comfort. Don't judge me. You've got your vices. And it's true. I find paracetamol to be a great comfort. And it's true. Who knows something can be a comfort and be true. So this whole argument that if something is comforting, therefore it's not true, that's just absolute nonsense. We understand that God is both true and the truth of God's existence is that he is a great comfort to you and I. Do you catch what I'm saying? Paul talks about the father of all compassion or father of mercies. And and I just love that the Bible says that his mercies are new every morning. Who knows that's a good thing? Because sometimes it feels like trouble comes every morning. Sometimes you wake up to a text message, there's trouble, it's already coming, knocking on your door. But I just thank God that no matter what I wake up to tomorrow, I know that there is a Father in heaven. He has got fresh mercy for me today. So whatever the trouble is that comes tomorrow morning, there is going to be mercy that is sufficient to meet that trouble because I've got a Father of mercies who's watching out for me. Praise God for that. 
But then it talks about not just the Father of mercies, it speaks about the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, that to me as well is a great comfort. The fact that in Jesus, God Himself has lived the human experience and has been tempted and tested in all points such as we have. Hebrews says that during His earthly life, Jesus offered up many prayers with great cries and tears. Why? Because Jesus was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Means this, that the man upstairs is literally the man, Christ Jesus, who knows what it is to walk the path of trouble and pain and suffering. What a great comfort that is. My One of my favourite verses in the Bible, one day I want to preach a whole sermon on it. It's a two word verse. So if you're ever starting Bible, Scripture, memory uh, exercises, this is the one to start with. John 11 verse 35, it'll be on screen. It says, Jesus, Jesus wept. There you go. You've memorised verses of the Bible. Smallest verse in the Bible, but it's got some of the biggest truth in the Bible. Jesus had just turned up at the house of Mary and Martha. Their brother Lazarus has just died. And Jesus is about to raise Lazarus from the dead. And yet Jesus still takes the time to sit with Mary and Martha and weep with them. Isn't that amazing? Jesus knew he was going to resurrect Lazarus not long after. So Jesus could have walked in cocky. What's wrong with you? Turn that frown upside down. Don't you know? I'm the resurrection and the life. Where's your faith? But Jesus didn't do that. How merciful is Jesus that that he would take the time to sit and to weep, even though he knew the future. Why? Because we don't have a high priest who is not moved with the feelings of our infirmities, but, but one who fully experiences the human life. And so you might be here today and you're thinking, well, God doesn't have time to comfort me in my trouble. Isn't he busy, you know, keeping gravity in check? Listen, you'd be amazed at how God will sit with you even in your hardest moment and offer comfort, consolation and strength. If Jesus would weep with them, then the Bible says he catches every tear from our eye as well. What a beautiful saviour we have What a consolation that is. Then some of us would say, don't clap. The team have got me on rations of time today. Um, Some of us would say, well, that's all good and nice, but Jesus isn't sitting with me. He's he's gone. Well, well, I'm glad you brought that up because Jesus said, I'm going to return to the Father, but I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And one of the names of the Spirit of Christ, who is in all places at all times. He is the comforter. He is the counsellor. He is the one who comes alongside of us. And I'm just so grateful that the Holy Spirit comes and brings comfort and wisdom and counsel to each and every one of us. Listen, you might be going through a crisis on a Wednesday at 5.30pm. You don't need to wait for Sunday morning because the Holy Spirit is right there. The Holy Spirit can come alongside and comfort and counsel. In the in the Bible, the Holy Spirit comes pictured in the form of a dove. Why? Because a dove is a bird that brings brings peace. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. I was preaching in Melbourne last week and and birds started to descend while I was preaching. Literally, I saw feathers falling from the roof and I thought the Holy Spirit's come in bodily form. And then then I realised it was a couple of pigeons sitting on the drum kit cymbal and someone told me that pigeons are just backslidden doves. Anyway, and so, but I want to say wherever you find it, I don't know how that relates, but I want to tell you, We have a Father of mercies. Come on, thank God we've got a Father of mercies. We've got the Lord Jesus Christ who knows what it is to walk in our path. And we've got the great Holy Spirit who brings comfort and counsel, wisdom and strength, which means this, the presence of trouble does not equal the absence of God. Come on, I need to say that again. The presence of trouble does not equal the absence of God. If anything, it's through your trouble that you are introduced to a side of God that you never knew existed. Let's get to the final thought as the team come back. Thirdly, God can use our trouble to bring comfort for others. And this might be the point that I love the most. I firmly believe that God is not the author of trouble, but I do believe that God is a great redeemer of our trouble. Um, I think the only thing worse than suffering is when you go through suffering and it all feels pointless and meaningless. That's probably even harder to swallow than the trouble itself. But look at what Paul says. He says that God comforts us in all our troubles so that, everyone say so that. Say it nice and loud, so that. So that 
We can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. Oh, I love those words, so that. Right in the middle of our trouble, Paul puts the words, so that, which literally mean this. In the midst of our trouble, you can find purpose in the midst of your trouble. Here is the purpose of God in the midst of our trouble. What God will do is even though God doesn't author trouble in our lives, God will allow us to walk through some stuff so that He can work resource within our heart, so He can bring perspective into our lives, so He can work empathy and sympathy into our lives, so He can bring some some life experience in our seasons, so that when other people go through trouble, we've got something with which to comfort them, strengthen them, console their faith. Who knows, there's some things that you can't learn on a podcast or in a lecture. There's some things you have to learn by going through trouble. And if you can go through trouble, but keep a good attitude and just keep loving Jesus, you'll find that you get to the other side of that trouble. And yes, it was hard. Yes, it might've kicked you in the guts, but you came to the other side of that trouble with resource in your hand. Now I've got something with which I can comfort and strengthen others. Isn't it true that when you go through trouble, the people who are most helpful are people who have been through what you've been through? We, we all know that to be true. Think about this, there's, in Scripture, there's kind of three food items or foodstuffs that are symbols or pictures of comfort. There is oil, there is bread, and there is wine. Oil is a picture of something that brings healing. In Bible times, olive oil would be used to heal. Um, bread obviously nourishes and feeds, and wine makes us to forget our sorrows. You you won't amen because we're in church. Just pretend like you know what I'm talking about. Makes us to forget our sorrows and bring joy. Well, think about how, how do you get those three things? How do you get oil? How do you get wine? How do you get bread? You go to IGA. No, no, no. How do you make it? Well, the way that you you make olive oil is that you have to take the olives and you have to press them. The olive press the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus was pressed and crushed in his soul. Gethsemane literally means the place of crushing. It was an olive press. And when the olive is pressed and crushed, from that crushing oil flows, which can bring healing to others. How do you get wine? Well, of course, you have to get the grapes and you have to tread them underfoot. You have to crush the grapes in order to get wine. How do you get bread? Well, you have to take the grain and you have to grind the grain and then you have to put it through the fire. And then out of there comes bread that feeds other people. Can you see how God actually brings usefulness out of crushing, pressing, and the fires of affliction. We say, oh God, use me to make a difference in the lives of other people. And God says, I'm gonna use you to bring healing. I'm gonna use you to bring joy. I'm gonna use you to bring bread, nourishment to other people. We're like, yes, God, that would be wonderful. And God says, okay, let me talk to you about the process. And God allows you to go through that bankruptcy. God allows you to go through that relationship blow up. God allows you to get bullied in your workplace or get gossiped about. God allows you to go through all of those seasons, not because He loves it, not because we love it, but it's amazing what God can bring out of those seasons. After the crushing, after the pressing, after the fires of affliction, God causes you to come out and you've got oil to minister healing to somebody else. You've actually got wine that can bring joy to others. You've actually got bread that can nourish others. Listen, I want to tell you today, if, if you can just keep walking before the Lord, keep a right spirit, keep faith in your heart, even in the midst of trouble, you watch how God makes you so useful to other people on the other side of your trouble. I wish there was a shortcut to it, but I don't think there is. And, and isn't this, as I close now, isn't this actually the crux of the Christian message? That Jesus went through trouble that we might receive the oil of healing, the wine of fellowship and joy with God, that we might receive bread for our soul. It doesn't the Bible say in Isaiah 53, and I think Matt shared it earlier. Uh, Let me close with this. It says, He was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon Him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with His wounds we are healed. It's beautiful, isn't it? That's how God brings healing, by allowing Christ to go through trouble 
And if you hang around Christianity long enough, God may just want to make you Christ-like. And if He wants to make you Christ-like, He'll probably let you go through some crushing, some pressing, some fire, so that you can come out looking more like Jesus with something to offer to the people around about you. Does that help anyone today? It doesn't mean that you're going to walk out of church and everything's perfect, but it does mean that you can walk out of church knowing my troubles are not without purpose. There is a so that to my trouble. And God, instead of asking you, why? God, I'm just going to ask, God, what do you want to develop in me? And who can I minister life and joy and healing to on the other side of this trouble? You say amen today? Come on, why don't we pray? Heavenly Father, we just thank you that in the midst of trouble, we can look up and there is a Father of mercy. Oh Lord, some of us today just need to know that your mercy is new today, every morning. Come on, even now, just as we pray, some of us just need to lift our soul before the Lord and say, God, today I receive fresh mercy. God, you're empowering strength. God, courage, hope. We thank you for the Father of mercy. Jesus, we thank you that you are moved with the feelings of our infirmities. Jesus, we thank you that you can comfort us, stand with us, even in trouble. Holy Spirit, even now, come on, if you just while you're, where you're seated, even now, if you're going through trouble, would you just lift your hands to the Lord? Come on, just right across this place. The righteous can go through many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. Come on, just lift your hands to heaven. Holy Spirit, just come right now, I pray. To every person with a hand raised, Holy Spirit, come. Those who are troubled in mind. Father, those who are troubled in their soul and their spirit. Lord, those who have got trouble in their body. Father, we just pray, send your Holy Spirit to come right now. Holy Spirit, come. Even now, like a comforter, a counsellor, come alongside, strengthen the hands that are weary, lift up those who feel like their strength is failing. God, we just thank You for the comfort and the strength. Let the reality of what we know to be true about the Holy Spirit be felt and experienced by every person with hands raised. Let it not just be a doctrine, let it be a living reality today, we pray. Come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit, come and bring oil, come and bring wine, come and bring bread from heaven. Strengthen souls today. Lord, we thank You that even in the midst of trouble, we find Your presence there. Even in the midst of suffering, there is fellowship with our Lord and Saviour. There is communion with the Holy Spirit. So God, be an ever-present help in time of need we pray. That's it. Some of us just right now, you're waiting upon the Lord. Your strength is being renewed. Father, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Lord, even in the midst of a valley, we just determined to keep eyes on our shepherd. We thank you that you're with us. You comfort us. You strengthen us. You refine us. You mature us. And God, because of that, we give you all of the praise, all of the glory, all of the honour in Jesus' name. Come on, church. Can we just clap our hands? Can we honour the Lord Jesus? Can we thank Him for His goodness? For more information about a Calvary campus near you or to join us online, visit our website calvarycc.global.